Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Uh, today we are discussing uh, a summary of the previous lecture, uh, nemoperitoneum and the physiological effects uh, and response of the body to the nemoperitoneum. As I promised in the previous lecture, that was a really uh, fully detailed and uh, uh, longer one, but uh, here we are just discussing the summary in a few slides. So the physiological response to pneumoperitoneum and the implications of laparoscopic surgery. I'm Dr. Akhtar Nawaz Aurakzai and presenting this topic. So what is pneumoperitoneum? Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, pneumoperitoneum is the presence of uh, air or gas in the peritoneum. This is just to provide a, a, a space uh, and, and which is gas filled within the peritoneal cavity so that we can work. And the purpose of this is to provide a working space and a clear vision for laparoscopic and robot assisted surgery. Uh, typically, uh, this is achieved with insufflation of carbon dioxide. However, other gases uh, uh, were also previously tried in the past. Uh, but carbon dioxide has got its own uh, positive uh, mm, uh, positive factors uh, uh, like for example uh, it is rapidly absorbed and absorbable uh, so it is absorbed through the peritoneal cavity but it is also eliminated very easily by the lungs uh, as compared to other gases which may be retained so so it can easily be um, uh, removed from the uh, circulation uh, so the, the side effects or the um, negative implications of this uh, carbon dioxide can be uh, minimized by eliminating it from the body easily. And the second thing is that it is non-combustible. You can use any kind of uh, energy source, monopolar, bipolar, um, uh, Ligashore or the NCL or uh, Thunderbeat any kind of uh, energy source uh, can be used and it is really inexpensive as compared to other gases such as helium and others. Uh, where does this carbon dioxide come from? Um, one is in environmental carbon dioxide uh, and the other one is industrial grade uh, carbon dioxide which is really sterile. So that gas is uh, compressed under high pressure, it's converted to a liquid form uh, which is under high pressure and is really very cold. So um, there are very minimal chances of uh, infection. So hardly any viruses or bacteria can survive that uh, kind of temperature. And uh, then uh, when and, and, and a large amount of uh, uh, this gas can be converted into small amount of fluid and can be stored in the gas cylinders. So it is really very uh, inexpensive and readily available. The effects of uh, pneumoperitoneum on the cardiovascular system and its responses are that there is increased intra-abdominal pressure which can lead to mechanical as well as humoral changes. Um, the mechanical effects are on the uh, vasculature uh, as we all know that arteries are really um, a thick wall. They have a proper, properly developed muscularis uh, layer and uh, however the veins are usually thin walled so the compression uh, can really compress the veins more as compared to the uh, to the arteries so there is compression of the inferior vena cava which can lead to decreased venous return or decreased preload uh, and and there is increased pulmonary vascular resistance and um, there is increased systemic vascular resistance the initial response of uh, this compression, the decreased cardiac output and the increased uh, peripheral arterial resistance is that the baroreceptors are, uh, they are activated and the reflex leads to increased heart rate to, to compensate for the uh, decreased in the venous return and decrease in the cardiac output. And thus my, mitochondrial contractility, contractility is increased. And this may also lead to increase in the blood pressure or uh, in, in worst case scenario, a deeper pressure can be can drop. This can lead to uh, uh, the peritoneal stretching can lead to um, activation of the uh, vasovagal nerve, which can lead to bradycardia and and blood pressure drop. And with, when such things happen, you have to really decompress uh, the nemoperitoneum. Uh, so this is the initial response and then the sustained, sustained response is that the cardiac output is decreased with increasing amount of intra-abdominal pressure, the cardiac output 
will decrease. So it is inversely proportional, which may lead to impaired cardiac function. So in cases where there is congestive heart, heart failure or left-sided heart failure, or uh, um, uh, the cardiac contractility is, is not very good, is a hypokinetic segment, um, the option of laparoscopic surgery may have to be considered, uh, 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 may have to be reconsidered and re-evaluation has to be done. And in, in long term, uh, during the procedure, it can lead to arrhythmias. Uh, this arrhythmia is due to um, um, acidosis, metabolic acidosis, because carbon dioxide may be retained and there is hypercapnia, so this may lead to arrhythmias and there is vasovagal uh, stimulation as well. Coming to the respiratory system, the, the, there is mechanical uh, effect on the, uh, on the diaphragm. So, so as it, it uh, elevates the, um, the anterior abdominal wall, to, to create a space for you to work in. It also pushes the uh, diaphragm, which is uh, relatively uh, a, a weaker muscle as compared to the anterior abdominal. Anterior abdominal wall consists of three muscles and sheath as well, and then rectus muscle as well. But the diaphragm is a single muscle, so it is compressed more. So this compression will lead to decreased lung compliance and functional residual capacity. And this may lead to increased uh, peak airway pressure. So there is retention of carbon dioxide, which is called hypercapnia. And uh, this is due to increased pressure of the carbon dioxide. So these uh, carbon dioxide under pressure is, um, is going into the bloodstream easily through the peritoneum as compared to uh, the lower pressures. So um, this may lead to increased arterial carbon dioxide, arterial pressure. Uh, partial pressure, sorry, or hypercapnia. And this may require controlled hyperventilation by the anesthetist to uh, maintain normal carbia. So when the respiratory rate is increased, so there is increased elimination of the carbon dioxide from the blood circulation. Then is uh, the clinical significance is that there is increased risk of ventilation and perfusion mismatch. And this can be overcome by the uh, uh, hyperventilation. Uh, the respiratory rate can be increased or there can be, uh, uh, this can be managed by positive pressure uh, ventilation to, to um, increase the uh, oxygenation or the, uh, to decrease the collapse of the alveoli in the lower basal uh, uh, portions of the, of the lungs. So this is, there is a potential in, in due to increased pressure. There is a potential for subcutaneous emphysema and pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum. Then renal and endocrine response is uh, the renal parenchyma is compressed, the adrenal gland is compressed, the renal vein is compressed and all this compression leads to decreased renal plasma flow or the blood flow and decreased glomerular filtration rate and this may lead to temporary or reversible decrease in the output. Then the endocrine effect is that uh, it can also compress the adrenal glands and release the hormone of stress that is catecholamine, renin and aldosterone. So there will be retention of, uh, of uh, sodium and water and there may be increased uh, release of the antidiuretic hormone which can also lead to decreased urine output. The gastrointestinal and neurological responses are that there is decreased splanchnic blood flow due to um, uh, due to compression, mechanical compression, and if that is prolonged, this may lead to bacterial translocation in 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 uh, longer cases. And if you increase the pressure from twelve to eighteen, this compression will be will be more significant and more chances of uh, um, bacterial translocation. So for that matter, um, the gut should always be every half an hour or every uh, 60 minutes you have to sprinkle uh, the gut uh, with the uh, with a warm normal saline so that it remains warm and uh, it doesn't lead to dryness uh, which may also um, play a major uh, role in the uh, bacterial translocation and and these effects may lead to minor changes in the gastrointestinal motility postoperatively however these are generally well tolerated uh, in neurological effects, uh, there is increased in the intracranial pressure, and that is because uh, the because of the flow, the inter, 
the the diaphragm is uh, uh, pushed so this may lead to uh, decreased uh, flow in the superior vena cava as well which may lead to increased intracranial pressure and uh, especially in the steep uh, Trendelenburg position. So this is a concern for patients with pre-existing neurological conditions such as uh, ventriculoperitoneal shunts uh, uh, and there is hypercapnia which, which, which leads to, um, um, to metabolic acidosis and can also lead to cerebral edema due to vasodilatation of the cerebrum, which can in, in further increase the uh, intracranial pressure. And cerebral edema has got its own effects then uh, with the bradycardia and the cardiac arrhythmias and uh, uh, pressure on the respiratory center. And, and you know all the, uh, uh, the effects of the, of the cerebral edema. So what are the clinical implications and uh, how will the anesthetist uh, manage those? So pre-operative assessment is really very important if, uh, if there are certain cardiac conditions like uh, hypokinetic heart or there is congestive heart failure uh, or there are other uh, valvular abnormalities, they have to be um, evaluated preoperatively. So an electrocardiogram, an echocardiogram, even for that matter, a stress test. Uh, um, if, if all these suggest an angiography or a perfusion uh, scan has to be performed. Then respiratory evaluation is extremely important because uh, cardiac as well as respiratory systems are two systems which are affected the most. And if these are uh, malfunctioning, then uh, the other effects on uh, the other systems of the body, they are going to be significant as well. Uh, as uh, we mentioned that uh, carbon dioxide is uh, also absorbed uh, during laparoscopy. So for, for the greater elimination of the carbon dioxide from the blood, uh, properly functioning lungs are really very important. So respiratory functions are assessed preoperatively by chest x-ray, by CT chest or the pulmonary function tests. So the higher expressions in such conditions would be severe heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uncontrolled hypertension, as well as morbid obesity. Uh, during the uh, intraoperative monitoring, during the operation, a continuous monitoring of the intidal carbon dioxide is really very important to know the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood. If that is going to increase, if the uh, pH of the blood is changing towards acidity, um, then hyperventilation has to be uh, has to be implemented and uh, adequate uh, hydration has to be maintained and your output has to be monitored. So these are the monitoring tools uh, and, and you can have a um, intraoperative ECG, uh, pulse oximeter, um, arterial uh, uh, pressure monitorings, etc. And as far as the surgical technique is concerned, from all this discussion, we know that we have to perform laparoscopy at the lowest possible uh, intra-abdominal pressures, uh, ideally less than 15, but 12 to 10 has to be the uh, ideal pressure uh, in which laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy is performed. And this allows the adequate working space. And uh, consider gasless laparoscopy for uh, higher risk patients and, and from the gasless uh, laparoscopy, I usually um, uh, consider it to be open surgery and careful patient positioning to optimize hemodynamics and, ven and ventilation has to be taken care of. So the conclusion and the take home message is that pneumoperitoneum induces significant multi-system physiological changes. The cardiovascular and respiratory systems are the most affected systems and these are primarily due to intra uh, increased intra-abdominal pressure and carbon dioxide absorption. And these changes are generally well tolerated by healthy individuals with good hearts and good lungs, but they require careful monitoring and management. And a collaborative approach between the surgeon and the anesthetist is extremely essential to ensure patient safety and a successful outcome. Thank you very much for listening uh, to the summary of the previous uh, presentation. Thank you.